So the number seven um, then, firstly the number seven uh, itself, just not in the Bible, the number seven, uh, so I'm sure we know uh, it's a prime number, it's the fourth prime number. It's also a Mersen prime, it's a double Mersen prime. I won't read them all out, we continue on, it's uh, quite, a, quite a unique number. Um, if you want to know the meaning of them, I can't explain them all. I'm sure there's some in the room who are probably much better qualified than I am. You can ask them. Um, seven is also the only dimension beside the familiar three in which a vector cross product can be defined. I didn't know there were seven dimensions. I knew about four or five, including space and time, but seven, well, the mind boggles. Again, don't ask me to explain it. Uh, this one I found a little bit more useful when we're playing some games at home, and that is that if you're using two dice, the probability of... Uh, of getting seven is the highest, being one in 36 or a six. So if you've got an important role, to bear that in mind, it's quite helpful. <laughs> but of course, more importantly then, what are we uh, hoping to look at tonight? And I say, we can't look at all of it. Um, so we're gonna look at a bit of background <coughs> to the words and the meanings, and then we just picked out some occurrences, significant ones of the number seven. I say it's not all of it, but hopefully, ultimately we can uh, take some exhortation away from this. So we look at the the root words in the Hebrew and the Greek, look at occurrences, frequencies, and most importantly, the first. Um, we look at creation, then the Sabbath, the lampstand, the revelation, then draw our thoughts to a conclusion. So the root words then, firstly, we're gonna look at uh, the Hebrew then. So the, there are a number of words you'll see from your handout, uh, but by far, the primary word, uh, 7651, as Strong's calls it, the word Sheba. And Strong's <coughs> defines this as a primitive cardinal number, um, seven, as a sacred full one, also seven times by implication a week, and by extension, an indefinite number. But you can also see there that it then links to 7650. Uh, so we look back at that, and uh, here Strong's, this is Shabbat rather than Sheba, um, a primitive root, properly to be complete, uh, but used also as a denominative of 7651, to seven oneself, that is swear, as if by repeating a declaration several times, a juror in charge. And Jesenius then just adds to that on this, the, the link to the word swear or an oath. And turn with me then just to illustrate this to Genesis 21. Just as a, a quick example, Genesis uh, 21, this is the chapter about Sarah being promised a child, um, and then the problems that this, this brings uh, to the family, and it can be seen as an allegory of God's purpose with natural and spiritual Israel, but we're just going to, uh, 21 of Genesis, um, and starting at verse 27, and Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abram set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abram, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by thyselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. Wherefore he called the place Beersheba, that's our word Sheba, uh, because there they swear both of them, thus they made a covenant. So um, we can see here how uh, the, the number seven is used to represent an oath or a, a covenant. And here we have the seven U's. And it's interesting that he then goes on to call this place Beersheba. And if you've got a, a, a margin, um, mine says that the well of oath. And that Sheba is the same word, 7651, that we saw. So we can see a first link here, Scripture is giving us, between the number seven and an oath. It's all about occurrences, I say, it's more detail on your handout, but just briefly then, looking at the English and <coughs> King James, um, we have seven, 372 times, sevenths, 110, and sevens two, those sevens there are related to the animals going into the ark. And you can see uh, then the two words that we've just looked at, Sheba and Shabba, um, and uh, the interpretations or how they're given to us in the King James. I won't dwell on this, you, you've got it on your handout. The New Testament then, a little bit more sparse. Uh, the primary word is uh, given the number 2033, Hepta, a primary number, which we've just seen. Seven, uh, and Thais doesn't really add anything again, just a seven, a primary number. 
Uh, not as many occurrences by a long way. Uh, we have 91 of 7, 10 of 7th, and no of 7s. I say more on your handouts if you want to look at that. So more importantly then, let's look at some um, first occurrences in the Old Testament and then uh, the New Testament. Now I've split this into the first occurrence in the English and then more importantly really the first occurrence in the Hebrew of this primary word. So uh, turn with you if you will then back a few more pages to Genesis 5 uh, and verse 7. Um, this is uh, the chapter in in Genesis 4 where God chastens Cain for his actions of killing his brother um, but then we read uh, a point of, of change um, later on in this chapter so I've skipped over the the English translation looking straight on to the Hebrew so uh, Genesis uh, 4 and we're going to read from verse 13 and Cain said unto the Lord my punishment is greater than I can bear Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So he said, we've got this change in the narrative from... Cain after killing his brother and God then putting this mark on him this mark of, of uh, protection now the, word, the sevenfold word is a different word that's 7659 shibor thathium probably completely wrong that only comes six times in scripture but it's not the word we're, we're looking at here um, that word comes in uh, verse 24 slightly later on um, this is the, uh, the first occurrence of this primary number seven and uh, here, this is uh, Lamech uh, speaking, and we're going to read from verse 23 for connection. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zilhah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man of my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So this is the first occurrence of the primary word for seven. Okay, well what can we learn from this? Well, Lamech was a man of the flesh. We read there how he was proud of the kingdom that he had created. As an aside, uh, he was the first man to break the sanctity of marriage by having more than one wife. Um, this is what he says to himself, we read there in verse uh, uh, 23. But then in verse 24, uh, he makes this statement that if God should be avenged, uh, Cain should be avenged seventyfold. This is the promise that God's made previously. We just read in verse fifteen. <coughs> Truly, Lamech seventy and sevenfold. <coughs> and so, really, here he's asserting himself. The, the, the flesh is is being puffed up here, and really, he's he's comparing himself to the promise that God made to Cain, and he's saying really that he's more competent than God. And this is an interesting uh, pattern in Scripture. Um, uh, because there's only one of the time we really have this pattern um, of sevens that we read in verse 24. You've probably already gone there in mind, but let's go to Matthew 18. Because first we've read here, we've got this sevenfold, 70, and then sevenfold again. And so you've probably already got there, but in Matthew uh, 18 we read of... of um, this pattern again. Matthew 18, starting verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. And Jesus said unto him, I say, not unto thee until seven times, but into seventy and seven times. So we have this same use of this word seven and seventy and sevenfold or seventy in the New Testament. Um, now this is interesting really this just as an aside because <coughs> Jesus gives this a number of course we know he's not speaking 490 as an exact number that's how many times you forgive your brother of course it's a figurative number but this is more to this because in 1 Corinthians we know that if true agape love it tells us that we bear no record of wrong of what our brothers and sisters have done to us 
And so if we really do that and remove their sins as far as the east is from the west as we pray our Father will do for us, then really that tally will never get past one. Because they'll sin and we'll forgive and we'll remove it. So next time we don't bear that record. It's just an interesting comparison there. But of course uh, it's, it's symbolic, the numbers here of 7 and 70 that we see. So that's the, the, the first occurrence in the Hebrew of this primary word 7. But there's more we can glean from this story of Lamech. Um, turn with me to Jude if you will. It's for Revelation. Jude, and uh, it's an interesting verse here. Um, and we're interested here just in uh, verse 14. And it tells us here, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things saying behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of saints so it's, it choose here by inspiration to tell us that Enoch was the seventh from <coughs> Adam okay turn back then to Genesis 5 to this record because um, in Genesis 5 uh, we're given here a list of the descendants of Seth uh, and it goes through, um, we'll see in verse uh, 9, uh, it gives an age of Enos and then who he begat. Uh, then verse 12, the same. Then verse 15, the same. Verse 18, the same. But then the narrative changes because in verse 21 we come to this man, Enoch. And scripture doesn't clearly tell us just how old he was and who he begat. It gives us some more information. Here the scripture tells us that Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God. So this seventh generation from Adam is singled out as having a particular characteristic. And why is this interesting? Well, in chapter 4 we have this same pattern again. If you turn back a page... Um, Looking here, we have uh, uh, another genealogy, again, this is uh, the one of Cain, and uh, yes, yeah, so starting at verse 16, we have the same occurrence, uh, and Cain went out in the presence of the Lord and dwelt under the Nod, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and then verse 18, uh, an Enoch, that's a different Enoch by the way, was born, and then just lists the names. Irad begat, and so on and so on, and then we get to this man Lamech, who we've just looked at. Again, he then was also the seventh in the generation, coming from Adam, hopefully, and just about see that. So here we have uh, two different lineages from Adam, and at the seventh point, or the seventh generation from Adam, we have two very distinct uh, families or camps portrayed to us. We have the one of Lamech that we've looked at, one who was of the flesh and proud of what he had done. And then we have the contrast with Enoch, we're told, a man who walks with God. And so scripture clearly paints to us a right and a wrong way, doesn't it? Choose life in the right and the wrong way. Well, why does scripture do this? Well, the order in which they are uh, presented, these two um, uh, different lineages is significant because as we know scripture tells sets a precedent in 1 Corinthians 15 you don't need to turn there Howbeit that was not first which was spiritual but that which was natural and afterwards that which is spiritual um, again Hebrews 10 he taketh away that he may establish the second and this is again something I'm sure we all know but a pattern that scripture paints about the elder serving the younger and we can see this here in the two generations, the one that walked with God and the other that was a man or a lineage of the flesh. Okay, uh, the New Testament then, um, we have the first uh, occurrence in uh, Matthew 12. It's up on the screen, you don't need to turn there, you can if you want, Matthew 12, 45. Um, he goeth and taketh him seven other spirits more wicked and himself and they enter in and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first 
even so shall it be also unto that wicked generation. Now the context here in Matthew is that um, Jesus speaks this parable in response to the Pharisees who ask him for a sign because obviously the miracles weren't enough of a sign for them. Um, and then at the end of that section, Jesus finishes with this little parable in verse uh, 45. Now some uh, have paralleled this with the work of John the Baptist, how he went to prepare the nation. Um, they then became responsible people, but then when Jesus t uh, came, they turned away. And so the state of them was worse the second time than when they had not known the first time. Um, but for us, we can draw a parallel with Second of Peter, if you want to turn there. In Second of Peter in chapter 2. Two Peter 2 uh, and verse 20. <coughs> For if after they have uh, escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Uh, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that is washed to a wallowing in the mire. So they're the first occurrences of the primary word seven for the, uh, for the Old Testament and the New Testament. So let's, uh, oh, the verse on the screen. So let's look at um, some examples of number seven. We're going to start by looking at uh, creation. Because of course, um, although we've looked at uh, the first occurrence of the English word, we've looked at the first occurrence of the Hebrew word, really the first occurrence of the or incidence of the number seven is in the creation um, and so here in Genesis 2 um, words we know well going to turn there but we, we read that on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested the seventh day from all his work which he had made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all the work which God had made now this is different from the primary word used, but it's uh, a different word. I think it's on your sheet. Um, shabi, shabi, probably pronounced it wrong, but that's that's the Hebrew word, and it occurs three times in these two verses. Now um, we know that God was not resting from weariness, and let's just remind ourselves of of the proof for that in Isaiah um, chapter forty. We read the following verse. Isaiah 40 and uh, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. So as we know, this wasn't because God was tired or worn out from what he had done. Well, what was it? Well, um, where else in scripture do we read of finished, rested and made in the same section? Well, it was in our reading that we had from Hebrews 4. Let's turn back there. Because in Hebrews 4, um, verse 3, verse 4 and verse 9, we have this same pattern. Um, Um, we'll just jump to verse 4 uh, and he spake in a certain place on the seventh day of this wise that God did rest the seventh day from all his works in this chapter that we had then as the reading Paul comments at length upon this original rest and he shows how it was typical of what God had in store for his people um, because uh, he goes um, on to quote then uh, to continue in verse 5 um, if they shall enter into my rest seeing therefore it remaineth uh, some must enter therein to that rest in verse 9 there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God so we have this Paul building this argument about the seventh day in which God rested um, and of course we know this offer of rest is still open to us um, but those who uh, rest are not resting um, from. Um, they're, sorry, they're resting from their own works, as it says God did. Um, 
Well, what else can we take from this? Okay. Well, let's, let's take this a bit further. Okay, this word rest that we read of back in Genesis 2, speaking of the seventh day when God rested from creation. Um, the Hebrew word for Sabbath, if we get where I'm going, um, is derived from this word, and you can see that uh, borne out in, in the bottom there on the screen. So we have this link between the seventh day and God resting and the Sabbath day. And turning to Exodus 20, because it gives us uh, an absolute for this, Exodus 20 and verse 11. It's not just the linking of the Hebrew words, but um, Exodus 20 and verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So there we, we have this link. So what about this Sabbath day then? I've well, got some examples on the screen of some rules. Now, I'm not doing this to belittle the Jews at all, their traditions. I'm, I'm showing some of these to put into context about what we're going to look at. So some modern day examples that the Jews are not allowed to do on the Sabbath day. And some of these for them are born out of specific scriptural examples, hence why we get raising two letters. Um, and some other obscure ones, but some I thought were quite interesting about using electricity, how they're so worried about it that they even go and type, tape up their light switches so they might even by accident press the light switch. That's how fearful they become of this ritual of the Sabbath day. What was this Sabbath day really about? Well, turn with me to uh, Isaiah 58, because here we have a very excellent and succinct description of what this Sabbath day was uh, meant to be. It's Isaiah 58. And we're going to read uh, from verse 13. And if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath the delight, the holy of the Lord, honourable, thou shalt honour him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor seeking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Did you notice then in verse 13 how many times we have hired to there speaking of self? It says, thy foot, thy pleasure, thy own. And that was what the Sabbath day was. It was about not serving self and showing that agape, self-sacrificial love that we read of. And ultimately then, verse 14 tells us, it was also a looking forward to that kingdom age because it says there that God will cause thee to rise upon the whole pl high places of the earth. And he'll feed you with the heritage of Jacob thy father. These are, these are uh, kingdom, this is kingdom language. And I'm just going to read you a short passage, if you'll let me, from um, Brother Roberts' book on Isaiah and the ministry of the prophets. And I think this encapsulates, encapsulates what the Sabbath was very well. And I quote, The observance of the Sabbath degenerated into a mere performance. The rabbinical superstition exhausted its integrity in making it ridiculous and binding upon its disciples burdens grievous to be borne. Under it, it is impossible for any to call the Sabbath day a delight. It's a quote from verse 13 there in Isaiah. Jesus himself, as Lord of the Sabbath, him came into condemnation too. Just as an aside, then he quotes Jesus and his miracles on the Sabbath day. We have seven distinct works of Jesus on the Sabbath day. Why do I say distinct? Well, the second one you'll notice that after the, uh, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, it just adds on and many more came to him and were healed. But there were seven that are explicitly named and described to us of works that Jesus carried out on this Sabbath or seventh day of rest. The quote then continues, the true observance of the Sabbath was only possible with those who had respect to the covenants and looked for the heritage of Jacob in faith and obedience. We must look for the heritage of Jacob in the rest that remaineth, Hebrews 4 that we just looked at, for when Christ returns and causes his people to ride upon the high places of the earth. That's quote to verse 14 in Isaiah. 
So what can we learn then from this creation and the Sabbath and the seventh? Just a, a mini summary of some of the things that we've looked at. Well, um, creation then, uh, seven, because it was when God rested, the end, it, dis- it divides our time into series of seven into weeks, um, which of course we still use today. God's pattern was that the seventh day was to be a day of rest. Um, now this, of course, was already going on even before in Exodus 16. It's promulgated as a given a name and a, a particular order, but it must have been going on before. Um, the Sabbath day was impen- intended as a pattern for man to follow. It wasn't about a list of rules. It was rather about them showing God manifestation, denying themselves and working for the better and ultimately the glory of God to fill the earth. Um, Secondly, then, of course, it also was there to point forward to the kingdom, to keep their minds focused on the things that are eternal and to come. Point forward to the kingdom of God and the thousand-year reign of Christ, when the earth will be at rest from the weariness of man's sinful rule. Okay, so we're going to look at on uh, Sabbath and the seventh of creation. I'd like us then to, uh, in our fifth section, look at the lampstand. Um, I'm sure this is a picture you're all very familiar of, and a story which you're all very familiar of, just to remind ourselves. Um, Titus, near the overthrow of Jerusalem in AD 70, um, they took the golden lampstand, candlesticks, but lampstands, uh, the table and the showbread and the silver trumpets and the book of the law, and in triumph they carried them to Rome and put them in their own temples. And we know this from script, uh, from uh, historical records and from this um, written on the, ta- uh, the arch of Titus in Rome. And if we go just inside this, we can see it uh, depicted there. So let's take a little bit more detail then at this lampstand. Turn with me to Exodus 25, if you will, and look at some uh, specifics. So Exodus 25. And we start reading at verse 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick or lampstand of pure gold. Of beaten work uh, shalt the candlestick or lampstand be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, his flowers shall be made of the same. The six branches shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the lampstand or candlestick on the one side and three branches on the other side. Jump then to the verse 37. Um, and thou shalt make the lamps thereof. Uh, and thou shalt light the lamps. Uh, sorry. Uh, verse 36. The knops and their branches shall be of the same. All of it shall be beaten of one beaten work of pure gold. Um, so some points that we can take from that passage, I won't dwell on it because I'm sure the things we all know well, but some points about it was it was opposite the table of showbread in the holy place. It was the only source of light because of a very thick multi-layered covering which, which would have blocked out all the natural light. Uh, it was a single piece of pure beaten gold. Uh, it had six branches either side emanating from the central stem. Now note, it's never described in scripture as having seven branches, seven lamps, yes, but never seven branches, always described as coming out of the central shaft. Um, and it's a, we read there was one piece of beaten work. Well, just to bring it perhaps into some modern things that we can articulate and imagine, um, of course it's not about value, but it's helpful to to look at these comparisons to bring scripture to life um, gold currently is sitting about £25,000 a kilo it's dropped uh, back to 2010 prices sorry if anyone invested in after that time um, so we, we're talking about anywhere between because we don't specifically know what a talent was but anywhere between 0.8 of a million to 1.8 of a million for this golden lampstand we're talking about a valuable piece uh, of work but also the skill that's involved to make this from one uh, beaten piece of gold things we know well where it was uh, just to remind us of its location so why seven then what what's this all about well firstly let's look at the central shaft and we have uh, a parallel drawn with revelation one i put this one on the screen revelation one and verse 12 and i turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned i saw seven golden 
lamps uh, and in the midst of the seven lamps one like the son of man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paths with a golden girdle <coughs> note here it doesn't say uh, the son of man in the midst but one like unto the son of man in the midst and this is uh, significant because um, at this point we have the outworking of the symbolic lampstand because Daniel 10 verse 16 after the anastasis that figurative raising up Daniel set himself saw one like the similitude of the sons of men and what they both saw in these in these visions was the symbolic representation of the multitudinous Christ um, with each member making of this up of this body like him as 1 John 3 2 tells us but of course for that to happen for there to be a multitudinous <coughs> Christ we need to be associated with Christ and partakers of his covering and so we have then this central stem from which the branches emanate and well-known verse we don't turn there John 15 verse 5 tells us that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches now although we have this one central stem and then the the three branches coming out either side as we know it was of one work it was a one piece of beaten gold well why of course we know that Christ himself was made like a man he was the uh, you know the same flesh and blood and he was tempted in all points like as we are and he too had to endure fiery affliction and I'll read these from the screen 1 uh, Corinthians 3 13 every man's works be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of, work of what sort it is and Job tells us that we have co to come through these trials to come forth as gold Job 23 verse 10 but he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And then Peter takes this a step further in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 1 verse 7, because he says, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it were tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Christ. So why six either side, three on the one and three on the other? In my research, uh, one brother's work uh, made an observation, not being categorical, I thought it was interesting. And he says, uh, there are six lamps which may represent the number of man, and on both sides of the lamp were three, which may represent the light of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection offered to both Jews on the one side and Gentiles on the other. Some, some food for thought. But we haven't really answered why seven is our topic tonight. Um, so turn with me, if you will, uh, to Revelation 4. <coughs> Revelation 4, we have um, a parallel here, or, uh, uh, yeah, parallel drawn, and we're going to read uh, Revelation 4 and verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So where else, we've got this parallel with the spirits of God, the seven spirits of God, where else do we read of this? Well, we read of it in Isaiah 11. Um, I think I've got this on the screen to save you turning up. I've got this on the screen. So Isaiah 11 verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch, shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of God shall rest upon him, Jesus, this central stem, Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. So here we have these seven attributes of this Spirit of the Lord, or sorry, the Spirit of the Lord and the six constituents that make up that, so being the seventh. But this is also an exhortation for us, is it not? Because we've spoken of being one piece. It was made up of gold, beaten, but it was one piece. And so we too must strive to be of one piece in our manifestation and way of life. So it can be said of us, as in John 15 verse 4, that we abide in him. But 
but also while we're looking at the lamp stand before we move on, um, as we said, it also provided light uh, from oil. And so having seven lamps, just as the seventh day in the creation marks the completion of creation, so the seven lamps provided a complete and perfect light in that holy place. And Christ himself was a perfect example of that, we read uh, in Luke 2.32. Before we move on, I'd like to just read uh, a passage from another Christelphian work. Just I thought summarised the lampstand uh, uh, quite well, and the number seven. The lampstand light was sevenfold, a symbol of completion. It gave out light that was perfect for the purpose intended. That purpose today is to be seen within the holy place, likened to the ecclesia, like the golden lampstand that reflected every green gleam of light. So each member of the Ecclesia is called upon to cooperate in providing a general illumination and reflection of the divine revelation in word and character. Just as the illuminated walls and furniture of the holy place made it an enlightened place for the priests to work, so the Ecclesia should be a place of light and beauty in which Yahweh's servants are enabled to serve with joy and gladness in the light of Yahweh's truth, revealed and reflected in every member. And so he concludes with the challenge, do you and I individually contribute in that way within the Ecclesia in today's wilderness wanderings? An exhortation for us all. Now I've stuck this in just as passing because I, I thought it was a shame not to uh, include it. I haven't got any answers to this. I haven't got any meaning. Perhaps something good for discussion afterwards. Um, but we're told that uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, in Paul, when he's writing, he used seven titles to refer to Christ. The heir of all things, captain of our salvation, the apostle, the author of salvation, the forerunner, the high priest, and the author and finisher of our faith. No answers, but perhaps something for us to di uh, discuss later. So our sixth uh, section then, Revelation. Now, this could be a Bible class in itself, so we're not going to look at everything in Revelation relating to number seven. Um, if you're looking at handouts, it uh, has a lot of occurrences in the New Testament. Um, but the number seven then is, is closely uh, uh, interwoven in Revelation. But before we turn there, um, we're going to look at Joshua 6. A story we know well and a pattern I'm sure we know well but just to remind us uh, in Joshua 6 I'm going to read verse 1 to 5 now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel none went out and none came in and the Lord said unto Joshua see I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor and ye shall compass the city all ye men of war and go round about the city once the shall do this six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall come to the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Um, so here we have a pattern of sevens within sevens, a story I'm sure we all know well, um, which has been referred to then as this Jericho pattern. And we can see how this is also used in the book of Revelation. We have sevens, then on the seventh occurrence after the six, this seven turns into another seven, and then the same again on the seventh turns into another seven. And that's a pattern used uh, in Revelation. This number seven occurs uh, in a number of instances in Revelation. Um, and some of these are up on the screen. We've got the seven churches, seven spirits, seven golden lamps we've looked at, seven stars, and so on and so on. Um, and for the sake of time, we're just going to take one of these. We're going to look at the seven blessings. And we're going to use these to draw our thoughts uh, together and to ultimately take some exhortation, which is important as we go our separate ways so the seven blessings of revelation then revelation 1 verse 3 blessed is he that readeth 
And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And how true that is for us. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, that they may rest from their labours and their works to follow them. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's seven thousand years. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And blessed are they that do his commandments, that they have right to the tree of life, and may enter into the gates of that city. So what are the things that we've looked at tonight then to draw our thoughts together and for some exhortation? Number seven is prevalent in Genesis, which we know is the seedbed of the Bible. It teaches us there of completeness and importantly it teaches us of rest. Not rest and ritual now, but a looking forward to that millennial rest. It also teaches us that the Hebrew word is linked closely to the word oaths and how that links into God's promises. We've seen at the lampstand how it was made of one piece of pure gold, tried as we are tried in our lives, also making up that multitudinous body of Christ. In Revelation we've seen a number of patterns building on that of Jericho and we, we read, particularly pertinent for us, that we must to be blessed in that ultimate age, to read and keep the word of God. And we must watch and not be naked. Thank you.